sometimes need direction. We sometimes need to hear your voice. And I pray today, God, that as I bring forth your message to your people, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that the words I speak, the meditation of my heart, would be not from myself, but from your throne to your people, that your voice may resound throughout this sanctuary today. And we ask it now in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen. Well, uh, the title of my sermon today is Why Grow the Kingdom of God? And that might sound a little strange uh, as far as a term, a sermon title goes. Uh, and you're probably thinking that, well, gee, pastor, everybody knows you're supposed to grow the kingdom of God. I mean, you know, we, we come to church and uh, we hear you talk about it. We go to Sunday school. We do our devotionals at home and, and we uh, read books and, and we hear Always, everywhere, people talking about that are Christian, people talking about we, we need to grow the kingdom, we need to get out and do that. So for most of us, I would think the idea of why grow the kingdom is pretty obvious. I mean, as a people who profess to know Jesus, we don't have too much trouble spitting out those words and thinking that thought of, that's the answer. We have got to grow the kingdom of, of God. We know it's the right answer. Isn't that good when you know what the right answer is? I mean, that's tremendous, isn't it? We know it's the right answer. Again, we've been taught it all our lives. But why ask the question that we all know the answer to? And then find it necessary for me today to preach about it because I feel like it's very necessary that I talk about why we need to grow the kingdom. And the reason I'm asking the question is because knowing the right answer is really not enough, okay? I wanna praise God, I, I'm, I'm going back to my childhood when I was in school and I was so excited my first day of school when they handed out all the books. I guess they still hand out books, don't they? I mean, you don't have to, but uh, I was so excited when I got my math book, because guess what? For the first time ever, and God bless this publisher, they put the answers in the back of the book. <laughs> I was thrilled. Answer, math in the back of the book, answers. And so our first assignment and all that, I was so excited, I was gonna make a hundred math. <laughs> I had every answer right. And I turned that paper in. And I flunked. <laughs> and I couldn't quite get it. Of course, I didn't get 100 even though I had, I had the answers right. I had every one of them right. But I didn't do what? I didn't show my work. <laughs> See, I knew that was too good to be true. I didn't show my work. I'm preaching this sermon today because while every Christian knows the answer that we're supposed to grow the kingdom of God, we don't do what? We don't show our work. It's not enough to know that we are supposed to grow the kingdom of God. That's a answer that every Christian can spout out. That's why we say we're here today. That's an answer that we are aware of. But folks, I'm concerned that we do not show our work when it comes to growing the kingdom of God. Let me begin by saying as a church, we bear a heavy heavy responsibility when it comes to growing the kingdom of God. The burden is upon our shoulders and nobody else's. We carry this burden. It's a God-given responsibility that we have. And in Luke 12, verse 48, we read these words. 
But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. And from everyone who has been given much shall much be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. We bear a responsibility. You and I who have been given much, we have been given the kingdom of God. We have been given the knowledge of salvation. We have been given an understanding of what salvation is that the world who is out there is searching so hard to find every single day of their lives. We got the secret. Or better, what's that cheer? We got the power. Yes, we do. Yeah, there you go. We got the spirit. That's even better. (laughs) We do. We have the spirit of God within us. And because we bear that spirit and that power in our lives, listen, responsibility is poured out upon us as Christians and as a congregation and as a church. God has given us the greatest gift that could ever be given He laid his life down for us in the person of Jesus Christ so that we could have life forever. Not just here, but life forever with God. He conquered death so death would not conquer us. Without Jesus, we would be doomed John 15, 13 reminds us, greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. See, that's how God sees us. God laid down his life for us, his friends. Greater love can never be expressed than the giving of Jesus on the cross. He gave us life during that time. And because of his great love for us, Jesus suffered a horrible death just so we wouldn't have to and that we could have life. And how does the Bible describe that? Abundantly. Life abundantly. And in doing that, in laying down his life, in being resurrected, in conquering death, He gave us the answer to a problem we could not answer for ourselves. He showed us the work to the answer. See? We had the answer. But Jesus wasn't just going to give the answer. He did the work. See, if God would have stayed up in heaven and just shouted down to us and said, Eternal life. If he would have just shouted the answer to us and gave us the answer and Jesus stayed in heaven and never came down and did the work, guess what? We'd still be lost. Even though we got the answer. If God would have said, you need Jesus. But Jesus never came. We would know the answer but we would still be lost. Jesus came and did the work among us. He did the work as an example for us. He, see, he said, what you see me do, you go do. In fact, he phrased it, greater works than this shall you do because I go to the Father. He didn't tell us just to do what he did. He said, you're gonna do greater things than I've done. Because I go to the Father. I have showed you how to work the problem. I have given you the answer. And now you know how to do the problem solving. To do the actual work. So part of the answer to the question, why grow the kingdom of God, is our God has given us the responsibility to do it. We are responsible for doing that. And that's why in our scripture, Jesus tells us 
or tells his followers, you shall be my witnesses in all the world. Go into the world to the outermost parts, which includes Dunlap. And be my witnesses. Do the work. Tell the people. Give your life for the life of someone else. It's my observation that we are too quick just to give the answer and do so without showing our work. Understand, I'm not saying we don't show some effort in trying to do kingdom things. I just don't think we show enough work to justify how we arrived at the answer. It's not that we don't make some effort. It's just that we don't give everything that God expects us to give in order to show how we arrived at the answer. And of course, to surmise the answer is to read the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission is really it, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest, the remotest part of the earth. That's not Dunlap, it's Whitwell. <laughs> the remotest parts of the earth. That's, that's the answer. Take a minute to look at how you labor for the kingdom. How you demonstrate your work daily. How are you impacting others you might meet or already know? How are you impacting them for the kingdom of God? What work are you demonstrating in their vision and sight that may show them how to answer this question? Has God's kingdom grown because of your work, because of your effort that you've invested in fulfilling the great commission or the answer? Hopefully, most of you can point to some successes you've achieved. A life maybe that's been drawn closer to God. Someone you've helped along life's road. A word, a testimony, an acknowledgement of God's impact in your life that you've shared with somebody or told someone that may have sparked the interest. It's like Curtis was saying, you know, pray for this guy. I, I got to talk to him. I hope I did something. You did. That's why I said, if you told him, just said Jesus, you've done something. You've impacted that life somehow. Because you can't say the name Jesus without doing something positive. When it's intended that way. Your heart was in the right place. Your work, you were working to show the answer to the problem. How have we done that in our lives? How are you doing that? It's really important. Because as I said, man, it's not enough to know the answer. You've got to show the work. That's how you arrived at that answer. And I want to tell you today, too, that what you've done, no matter how much it is, it's not enough. <laughs> Isn't that the most frustrating thing you ever heard? It is. However much you have done, no matter how wonderful you have demonstrated your work, no matter how much you focused upon that every day, I'm going to tell you it's not enough. There is not an age you reach when you can kick back, take it easy, and say, I've done it. In God's eye and in his mind, there is no retirement age as Christians, not while you're walking on this planet. For the younger people, the answer, let the more mature Christians do it, is not the answer. 
for the older person who said it's time for the young people to do it, that's not the answer. And for you middle-agers, whoever you may be, whatever you're thinking, that's not the answer. <laughs> we can never do enough. Never can you do enough. You know why? Because within a quarter mile of this church, there are people who have no clue about the answer. And as long as that's the case, we still have to show our work. As long as there is within earshot of this church, someone who is lost, we must still continue to show our work. There's a couple of things that really hinder us from doing it. And when we struggle with showing our work, there are reasons that we struggle with it. I think most of us are well-intentioned, right? I mean, in our heart of hearts, if you're a Christian, you got the best of intentions to show your work, to help people find the answer. But there's several things that may hinder us from doing that. And I got two words, or maybe a few more than that. Well, I'll narrow it down to two words. Just thing, things and time. We get things on our mind, and we don't give the time to show the work. Right? I mean, that's true. I mean, that's, that's a fact. Even the disciples, I love verse seven. He said to them, is it not for you to, it is not for you to know the times of the epics which the father has fixed by his own authority. They were even back then when Jesus was, he said, look guys, forget about all the other stuff. It's not for you to know all these things. Just show the work. I've given you the answer, show the work. Don't worry about all the other things. And see, that's what we worry about. There is not a day goes by, and I work at this place. I suppose, I'm supposed to show my work all day long. But there are days when I just don't because I get distracted by things all around me. I get pulled in different directions doing things. And I lose my focus on my main purpose and it just gets lost in the shuffle. How many of you this week have thought in your mind, boy, I'll never get all this done this week. I got so many things I've got to get done. It took me three days to cut my grass. Joan's tired of hearing, I, I'm telling her, I'm saying, we got to get home. I got I to gotta get out there. I got to get the rest of my grass cut. I, I've been cutting it for three days. It rains. I get off my mower. I leave it. And I get back on it and I cut it. And then my, my blades clog up. And then I'm down there trying to clean my blades and I can't get my grass cut. But we do, don't we? We get things on our mind and we think to ourselves, gosh, I've got so many things to do. And see, then that's where it filters into the time, Right? How many people this week have said, I just don't have time to do all the things <laughs> that I need to get done? You see how that works? We don't show our work because we wish that God had created, as the Beatles sang, eight days a week. If we just had one more day, Lord, just... If you could just somehow stretch it for me, maybe I would have the time to do all the things that I need to get done. But you know what? I've given some thought to that, and I've decided that as good as God is, 24 hours must be the perfect amount of time in a day. Or else we would have 26, or 29, or 30, or whatever would be. God has created time in hours, in minutes, and seconds, perfectly. So it is not God who's messing this up. It's you and me needing to learn how to allocate time 
to doing things. Keeping primary and most important the things that God has asked us to do. Now that will exhaust you this week thinking of that. I'm already tired thinking of it. I mean, really. When you think that the most important thing, the, if you prioritized your time and your doing of things to put foremost and in the front the things God would like you to do, that would blow your mind. But I want to tell you something, and I believe this. I'm not saying I've conquered this, but I, I'm willing to, if I, was will, if I was a betting man, <laughs> I would be willing to bet you if you prioritize the things of God first, then you would be surprised the time you would have to do the things you need to do. Now, it's scary to think about, but I believe that from the bottom of my heart. Doing God things first you would be surprised how much more time you would find in your life to do all the other things that you worry about and are concerned about. You believe that? I think that's true. There are enough hours in the day because God has established 24 hours for a day. We don't need any more. We need to work on it. I think. We are constrained by time and all we think we have to get done. So God's to-do list more often than not in